When I was a child, I railed against rules. Rules were nothing more than an outlet for power-hungry adults, risk-averse parents, or worst of all, lazy thinkers. Rules belonged in the adult world and were designed specifically for children, because ch children could not be trusted to keep themselves entertained, or to be kind, or to keep themselves safe, or to avoid adult embarrassment. Rules are a bit like cling film. They protect the real, authentic you from the outside world, and the outside world from the real, authentic you. But they're not all bad. Here are some rules I actually quite like. I actually like paying my taxes. I like not killing people. I like not breaking into people's property. I like going to bed at night, wearing clothes in public. I like cleaning my teeth. I like not speeding. I like eating healthily. And I like being kind. But here are some of the rules I don't like. Having to lie to someone when they ask me how I am. Having to tell someone who's done a terrible job they've done a good job, because that's being kind. I really don't like the rule of school uniform, but that's an argument for a whole other evening. <laughs> I don't like the rule when you're in a car that you have to flick your hand up at the person who's coming up because they haven't just knocked your wing mirror off. <laughs> I don't like the rule that makes adults think they're more superior and clever than children. I don't like the rule that says when you grow up, you're going to marry somebody from the opposite sex. At school, I didn't realize there were hoops to jump through to achieve academic success. And because the social rules were too preposterous to adhere to, I entered my adult life feeling like a failure, and a moral, rebellious one at that. It took me some time to shake off this image, but I think I've now learned how to turn this impulse, these impulses to my advantage. So when I was in my early 30s, working in a local theater, the Theater Royal, <laughs> I spotted a rule that needed changing. I realized, how come children don't get to go to theater on a regular basis the same way that adults do? So I mentioned this, and luckily there was consent amongst all those around me, and we built a theater for children and young people called The Egg. The week before we opened the theater, there were very few plays for children in Bath. And when we opened, there were at least two performances every week of the year. And there they all were, these audiences. They just showed up, and they're still there. So sometimes I think it only takes one person or one organization to do what hundreds of people had not even known they were waiting for. Later, I spotted another rule that could be changed. When children go to school, why do they always go to the same building? There's no reason, is there? So we changed that, and we created a residency project called School Without Walls, in which primary school children have been coming to school in our theater for the last six years. The first school to take part took a massive risk, but those schools that followed were shored up by the knowledge that the trailblazing school had not fallen on its sword. Now the process seems really quite normal. Surely a brilliant new business idea is a changing of the rules, a disrupting of the norm. Dyson discovered that you didn't have to put paper inside a vacuum. Lucas Aid decided that they could start selling small bottles of their stimulant to children instead of just the big bottles to sick people. <laughs> Changing a rule isn't really an act of will, a, will, a willful, singular act of rebellion against the existence of the rule itself, although my mother would say it was. Anarchy, it is not. It could be an act of logic and reason. This rule makes people feel like a failure, and that's not very productive, so let's change it. Sometimes we don't even know we're changing the rules. When I wrote essays at school, my default position was to do it differently, to come up with a unique proposition and rock the boat a bit with a new thought. Apparently, this creative approach wasn't very academic, and thus I was left feeling like a failure. You would think, would you not, that a nice, friendly place like a theatre, a place where art happens, would be immune from making children feel like failures. Yet, of course, like everywhere else, a child will only have an experience of live theatre through the prism of expectation of the adult that took them there. Those adult gatekeepers are awash with well-intentioned rules to educate their child, to help them with their exams, to broaden their horizons and make sure they get the message, for moral guidance, or simply to be entertained and have a jolly good time and not have one's parents' worldview challenged, not one little bit. They're merely adhering to a set of invisible rules, but in so doing, 
They place a layer of burden on the shoulders of those young people who are going to watch the play. The pressure to have understood the play and to be able to articulate that. The obligation to have an opinion about whether the play was good or not. The, the expectation that they will leave the theatre happier or better human beings than they were before they went in. And if they don't feel those things, might they not now come away feeling as though they had failed? And that it had been a piece of art that had made them feel that way. I work in the theatre. Does this mean I want to watch theatre, read about theatre, think about theatre, talk about theatre, do nothing but theatre 24-7? No, it really does not. There are other bits of me, really, side projects. <laughs> there are 8,760 hours in a year, of which children spend 1,372 going to school. That's just 16% of their time when they're being schooled. So when we take them to see a play, a work of art, why should we presume that we should continue to teach them stuff? So my job there is to create a mini-revolution, and that revolution is this. One, to treat the child like a human being that has a mind and a heart of its own. Two, for the duration of a play, to forget that they are young, which means there'll be no learning outcome. Three, that the child will not be told how to sit or how to behave. Four, that we will trust them to have the strength to face up to alternative realities presented in front of them. Difficult language they may not understand. Social constructs or natural phenomenon they haven't yet encountered. Boredom. And five, to support them through that process should they find it disturbing or confusing. So this might mean, one, not telling the child what's happening. Two, not pointing at something in a teacherly way. Three, not worrying if the child is more interested in the ceiling than the play. Four, not endlessly feeding the child. <sighs> I'm so glad I got that off my chest. Five, <laughs> not whisking them out of the room if they start crying and never bringing them back in again. Sometimes I witness similar forms of what I call negative adult intervention administered by the actual play itself, perhaps with overacting or silly voices to maintain attention at all times, or relentless audience participation so they don't get bored, or stories that conclude with an overtly moral or educational message, or just imitations of familiar stories and situations so as not to challenge expectation. It seems to me this is an art. It's a blind compliance, it's fear, it's control, and a notion that, rather than being uh, regular human beings, children are some strange, protected, alien species. The people who do this, they, they think they're doing absolutely the right thing, but it's not art. Art is the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. That's from the Oxford Dictionary. Art is something that reveals the essential or hidden truth, not a copy of what we think the truth should be. Theatre can ask the question, but if it ever tries to answer the question, we close the conversation down with the audience. Art is very, very difficult to make if you are bound by these rules that have been handed down on tablets of stone, like no one should get upset, no one should be scared, or no one should cry, or be shocked or offended, or have their views challenged, or their sense of world order turned upside down. Since the artist cannot hope to know the disposition or circumstances of all the myriad people who come into an auditorium, they are left only with their own idea of the world at their disposal, their own creativity and impulses and fascinations. Which is why, when people ask me, are there any topics you cannot put in front of children, my answer would be no, none. Thank you.